Good morning. If you want a copy of the slides, they're there. Uh, when we finally get synchronized with Dropbox, there will be about 14 papers on uh, Agile at that site, but it isn't ready right yet. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about Agile methods, but I'm going to talk about Agile methods that in fact are software engineering in the sense of using numbers and measurements and feedback. And I'm going to try and show that the best practices I recommend are proven by uh, measurement and quantified data. And uh, in, in my dreams, all talks at conferences offered the same evidence for whatever they are proposing. That is, facts that they really work and how they work and what they cost. Uh, I, I, I love very busy slides. Some people don't. So if you don't, I have a suggestion. Close your eyes. Relax. Meditate. Maybe listen. But uh, I have to have the, the, the busy slides because they are reality. They are uh, the detail. You can study them at your leisure. They're freely downloadable. If you uh, really don't uh, like uh, busy slides and you just want an easy ride, I recommend my TED Talk where they forced me to get rid of all my busy slides whether I liked it or not. Um, I was a programmer for about uh, 20 years and decided there was some higher calling, uh, something, let's call it software engineering, requirements engineering, architecting, and I thought that was a, a, a challenge. I'd, I'd like to figure out how to do it. And so uh, I've transitioned from being a programmer to being a, uh, uh, somebody who helps analyze and design that which programmers should do. And maybe some of you would like to make that transition after you've programmed for about 20 years. How many people ever here have programmed at least 20 years? Okay, so time, time left for the rest of you, okay? Um, I, since this is an Agile conference, I'll bring out my, what I call, Agile credibility. Uh, uh, you can call me Grandpa. I've got white hair, uh, and uh, I was fighting for these ideas uh, since the 70s, actually, when everybody thought I was absolutely crazy. And uh, nice to know that uh, the ideas, of especially iteration and feedback in particular, are now widely adopted. Um, here are some of your uh, heroes, although we don't really need them, <laughs> okay? Uh, but uh, commenting specifically on where they picked up their wonderful agile ideas from. Um, one of the things that worries me is that so many of you have somehow had an education where, in my view, you haven't been taught enough of IT and software history. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that at the same time. Those who, if, if we don't learn from history, the lessons we've learned and the methods we've learned, we will just reinvent the wheel, we'll make the same mistakes, and we'll waste years of our lives. So part of my role is to be the, not only the grandpa, but the historian. I remember, I met the people who did it decades ago before some of you were born. Um, so, uh, uh, just for fun, I picked up this picture of the uh, me and Indian guru costume, and uh, that's my son Kai uh, actually getting married, but I'm symbolically, uh, I'm, I'm the guru teaching my son, and uh, I hope all of you will be my symbolic sons and allow me to teach you what I know, and if I don't know enough, I hope you'll teach me back what I don't know, because there is uh, this vast body of knowledge that I don't know. Basic ideas of this talk. Uh, first, that managers are bad at, uh, managers, boo, right, are really bad at deciding your work environment. You should be the ones to decide it. IT architects are really bad at designing what you should program. You should be in charge of that too. And so uh, what I'm, this talk is all about is delegating power to the grassroots who uh, are much better at making good decisions about both their working environment and their, the, what they should be programming. Yes. Hey, okay. 
So uh, here's just uh, 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 the, the talk I was originally going to hold, if you're missing that one about architecture, it's on uh, a video, and basically I'm telling 300 architects in London that they're uh, childish idiots and quite an embarrassment to their profession, and I think they agree. Okay. Uh, how are we going to do this? Basic idea is we give um, some superordinate objectives from our stakeholders and users to the programmers, and they figure out smart designs and measure whether they're getting them. That's for the design. For their own environment, we give information to the programmers about their bugs and problems, let them analyze root cause, let them figure out how to cure it, and let them implement and measure that it's done. So it's uh, quite simply clear delegation of power. Here, uh, if nothing else, I just thought the picture was funny, so enjoy it in case you didn't realize that that's you, right? And the rest of them have other talents and, and traits. I'm going to start off uh, by giving some case studies from Raytheon and uh, IBM. Um, the, the contrast here is from top-down decision-making. Management decides uh, what, you know, what your working environment is going to be. And uh, what I really would like is to get you in the loop uh, deciding what your work environment should be and trying out your ideas and finding out whether your ideas are really what you want. Yeah. Let's see, push button, there we go. Uh, in 1970 to 1980, uh, two people at IBM, Michael Fagan and Ron Radis, um, they invent a thing called software inspection. And the intent was primarily to collect data on the working environment of the thousands of programmers at IBM and use these statistics to improve the environment. Long story short, it didn't work. I was there. I didn't have any wiser ideas myself. I didn't know why it didn't work. It sounded like a good idea. Get statistics, show what was frequently happening, and fix the problem. Uh, along came uh, Robert Mays and Carol Jones in 1980 from uh, IBM Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, and they had a, a very simple idea. Delegate the power to the programmers themselves to analyze their own environment. Don't let the managers do it. Don't make it a statistical accumulation. Make it, you know, our work, bugs that we created. Why did we do it? Were we sleepy? Was that the reason? Maybe the process changes to get more sleep before we get to work, that kind of thing. And that worked. It worked so well that uh, Robert got a citation from the chairman of IBM and a $100,000 prize just to indicate this was no minor accomplishment. It was uh, impacting the whole of IBM. There's a detailed case study, which I dearly love. You can easily access the details from the links there. We'll start off by, uh, they, they take a look at, uh, for 1,000 programmers, they take a look at what is known as the rework cost. Rework cost is the cost of fighting their own bugs and changing and retesting things. It is, where it normally is, if you're not measuring it and trying to uh, fix it, at about 43%. That means out of 1,000 programmers, 430 of them were tending the wounded from friendly fire, i.e. they were fixing bugs they themselves had created. That's what I call a really stupid army. Unfortunately, most of you are in that situation now, but you don't know it because you don't measure it. Try measuring the rework of what you do. We're pretty sloppy. Anyway, they learned from Philip uh, Crosby uh, work on quality is free, that uh, high rework is not an, an, a necessity or an act of nature. You can gradually improve your process so as to reduce it. In this case, they reduced it by a factor of 10, and they reduced it by a factor of about two within the first year. So in the first year, they're actually uh, saving about 150 programmers for productive work, and then uh, they uh, improve the process, sometimes they fail to improve the process well, and they keep on improving the process systematically using a thing called defect prevention process, DPP. That's the invention of Mays and Jones. Um, here are some other side effects. The productivity of the programmers went up by a factor of 2.7. This is on 26 projects. This is partly getting rid of the waste caused by fixing their own bugs, partly by smarter ideas that help make them more productive. Here's another one. 
they were actually quite good at running over any budget they had by only 40%, but within one year, they managed to get to the stage where they did not run, run over their budget ever for the next X years. Most of us, as you know, run over budgets by about a factor of 3.14 every time. Okay? Even if we multiply the original estimate times 3.14, we seem to do that. Uh, here are some of the process improvements they made, just to give you some sense of the detail. Uh, interface problems, regression test, repeatability, uh, inconsistent inspection process. Inspection is eyeballing code or code review here. Um, and uh, bad requirements, updates, and more problems with requirements. These are the ex real examples of the changes they made to their system to increase their productivity and reduce their lack of productivity. The uh, bug density went down by about a factor of three, which is nice, not exactly zero defects. More interestingly, they discovered that when they invested time in training people to do this and allowing them to do it, because I know your first excuse is, this is very nice, but we don't have time, okay? We're so busy fighting the fires, we don't have time to avoid the fires. But they, they figured out that they were uh, getting a 770% return on investment from investing in this. Okay, now how much is your bank giving you right now? Is it 2%, 3%? Okay. They used this argument towards their chief financial officer to get even more money to do even more and do it better. So you may not be interested in finance, but you may be interested in financing your adventures into better technology. And I think putting the argument about how, uh, what the payoff is will, will loosen the purse strings. That's what happened in this case. Uh, this is just a basic map of the defect prevention process. This is also identical with capability maturity model level five, as it started out, to give you another address for where is this uh, capability maturity model. Let me just check something. How many people here said, I knew about the defect prevention process before you began your talk, Tom? Okay, pretty good, about mm, less than 10%, okay? How many of you have ever messed about with capability maturity model? Okay, another 10% and almost a different group. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what's going on here is that the, uh, the thousand programmers who later got merged to another thousand, they're analyzing their own bugs and specification defects, such as in requirements. They're suggesting their own work environment changes, such as the ones I just showed you a slide full of, and they're reducing their 43% rework by 10 times. By the way, over an eight year period. Uh, management would like to get it done this year. Reality is cultures change slowly, but they do change if you measure and you persist. And so, uh, and you can get big changes in the first year, down from 43 to 27%, but you, you really have to have patient, long-term management thinking to get the full benefits of what is possible. Point is, power has been delegated to the programmers, and this works far better than anything else known then or now, okay? Here's one of my uh, clients in London who just, uh, looked at what Raytheon did and quite simply repeated it. They were just about to, uh, a startup just about to go out of business because they had so many bugs, nobody would buy them. They decided to copy the program and even had a five-year time horizon for reducing the bugs. They got so good at quality compared to their competitors that they took all the business going in their market from the competitors and won out. There's a lovely case study, Agent of Change, by uh, Dick Holland showing uh, how that worked. We just simply replicated what Raytheon had done. Here's another uh, example. This is from uh, what is now uh, Boeing, but was then McDonnell Douglas. And uh, we, we found that um, there was a tr uh, tremendous problem. There were too many young people coming in, like 2,000 in one year, new engineers, and they frankly didn't know what they're doing, so they were creating uh, errors and bugs all over the place. Uh, this is in aircraft engineering, not in software. Okay? These principles apply to any form of engineering or planning. And this was quite simply delaying airplanes and threatening the company's existence. Um, we found that uh, one simple drawing had 80 major defects per page. A major defect is violation of best practice or standard. We decided to measure this and set a standard. 
uh, you had to have less than one major defect to uh, get approved for handing out to anybody else. Uh, people started off at about 80 major defects and were told, your work isn't deliverable. So they got motivated, decided they wanted to feed their kids and keep a job. So they started learning the practices that the wise old men of the company had long since decreed. And they got pretty good, but they have, their learning rate is about 50% reduction per cycle of trying to get good. But within about five iterations, so this is for one particular person called Gary, but we had hundreds of engineers going through this curve. And um, within about five iterations, they managed to learn the good practices well enough to practice them in practice, uh, and uh, they get their work released. And that uh, was happening within weeks across thousands of engineers. There's case studies on that available if anybody's uh, interested in some of the remarks about how powerful it was. Um, so here's, here's a summary. Turns out that the Mays and Jones method, defect prevention, prevention doesn't mean we find a bug and fix it. It means the bug never happens, ever. There's nothing to find. That's the best uh, condition of all. And it, it turns out within about a year, 50% of all the bugs that normally happen will not happen. And as you improve your uh, process and, and put in a lot of changes, you uh, move up towards NASA levels of uh, order of magnitude, 99% of all bugs that normally happen don't happen at all. Um, the ones that do happen can be caught early by inspections, where at least the advantage of catching them there is they're 10 times cheaper to repair, because it's early days. And what you don't catch early, you're gonna catch by testing, and what you don't catch by testing are our gift to the user, of course. But this gives a perspective of these different technologies working together over time. Um, one, one thing that I like to highlight here is some experiences from IBM in, in various places. But the very first line there, in a 30-month period, there were 2,162 changes made to the working environment of the programmers, suggested by them. In other words, there's not one big idea or, or uh, which is what managers tend to focus on, the big idea from the consultancy. We should go agile or what a go lean or whatever it is. Get level uh, five. It, it's, it's actually a whole lot of very small practical ideas about physical working environment, very largely. Noise, office space, when you can come into work, uh, support systems. And uh, so, so the, the big idea is that the many small ideas seem to add up to tremendous real improvement. And the big ideas for management tend to fall flat on their feet because people resist them. People don't suggest ideas that they would resist. They suggest ideas they'd like to do, tools they'd like to have, working environments they'd like to have. So this is one of the, in other words, if management suggests a change, there's an automatic resistance. So these dumb managers suggested stuff and it isn't relevant for us. If we suggest it, we're very likely to suggest stuff we want and will accept, and the whole problem of change resistance is dramatically changed. So here's a summary. Developers are better at managing their own work environment than managers are. Directors should not design the work environment. The developers should evolve the uh, environment through their practical, everyday, deep, personal insights about why, has, why have I created a bug or a bad requirement or whatever I've done. And they should take responsibility for their own situation. So, we're gonna turn our attention to a uh, related subject, which is uh, delegating to the developers the actual detailed design if you like, delegating to them an architectural role. And uh, so the I uh, idea, again, is that uh, uh, who decides design? Well, the customers and users, when they say, I want this and I want that, are often, in fact, uh, although we may call it a requirement, they're really uh, designing the system and telling us what to program. And salesmen representing them may do the same thing, and architects, by definition, uh, try to figure out what, uh, what design we should use in programming. The, the new idea is put the programmer in a loop, uh, a tight loop of maybe weekly loop or something like that, you might like to call it a sprint, and uh, allow them to uh, make the design decisions, to program them, 
to tr- test them and measure them and see if they're any good. Leave that whole decision making to them. Refuse to accept anything resembling a design from these people uh, on the basis that they're not qualified, they don't have an overview, uh, et cetera. They're just amateur designers. We've been allowing the amateur designers in too long. Uh, these, uh, you are pr- capable of being professional designers. These people do need to give us signals like, I want it to be more user-friendly. But how it's going to be more user-friendly is something we need to figure out uh, technically. So I'm going to give you a case study on that. This is my favorite uh, client who's done everything uh, better than I could possibly teach them. They're in Norway. Uh, We met them as a gang of about uh, 13 developers and three testers. Here's even... uh, Petter, the founder of the company, entroned our test manager, who's our hero, and people like that. Um, the interesting thing about this team is, five years later, the same team is still there. You know why? They love their working environment, because it has empowered them. And they know that going anyplace else isn't going to empower them, so they just stay. Okay? Wouldn't you ha- ha- like to have a working environment? You just didn't want to leave. It's so nice. Okay, the working environment, not the perks, the working environment itself. But that's, so you're looking at it. Um, when, when we met them, they'd been eight years in an international market with clients like these. Um, they had 50% of the world market, which isn't bad for a little Norwegian company from Oslo. Uh, but they took our advice to dump the 1,500 requirements in a queue, which were largely designs by the amateur users, dump them forever, and they did, and focus on some high-level requirements set by the marketing director. We need to be more user-friendly and things like that. Here's an example of one of them written in my planning language, language, which says, okay, you have a subset of usability called productivity, define it, time in minutes to set up a typical specified market research report. The old release, 65 minutes, we'd like at least to get down to 35 minutes. This is every user every day kind of thing, and in our dreams, we'd like to get to 25 minutes, that would be fantastic. So that's, uh, now, so this is the requirement coming in from the outside, but the programmers stare at that and say, how are we gonna design the system to get to 25 minutes, is the question. And they're gonna make a decision to try to do it, program test it, and see how it goes, okay? Uh, this is just saying they've com- completely left the, the idea of the detailed, features and burn down stacks and user stories and all this kind of stuff. And so I decided to focus on the, what I call the top 10 most critical objectives at all times. Um, Tron uh, whipped up a little tool. We've since got far more advanced versions of it than this. But on, uh, this tool is a snapshot of week nine out of 12 weeks. After 12 weeks, quarter of a year, they released to the world. But in the nine intervening weeks, we call them uh, value delivery cycles, something like a sprint, except sprints are not really focused on delivering value, they're focused on delivering code, Um, but we're focused on delivering value. So here's the requirement we looked at, where these are requirements, this is the one we looked at, uh, currently 65 minutes, and let me run you through a sequence here. uh, uh, the, uh, we're, we're trying to move from here to there. We want to at least get to the 35 minutes. We'd love to get to 25 minutes. So, the, uh, and we have 110 working hours with about four people working on this agenda for a quarter of a year. Okay, the, the team chose the beginning of step nine to work on this one because nothing had been delivered or improved for the previous um, eight weeks. They had a similar problem here and here. They've been working on the things of the big numbers. Those numbers there, 100 means they've met their goal. 200 means they've done twice as good as the goal. 50% means they're halfway to the goal. So this gives the project team an agenda. Basically, the weakest uh, links in the chain need to be worked on. This is what we call dynamic prioritization. And the team is at liberty to prioritize whatever they want. Nobody is going to tell them what to do. Their only agenda is, at the end of a quarter of a year, deliver these goal numbers within this time frame. So that's the agenda. Get to 25 minutes. They've decided to work on that that week. They have a um, 
stand-up meeting, and uh, within a half an hour, uh, uh, suggest about 12 different designs. One of them is market information recoding, and the question we ask of every design is, okay, you think that's a great design, how many minutes of the 40 we need to save do you think we'll save? And the estimate here was 20, and that was the best one. And uh, they also uh, felt it would take them their four working day cycle to do it, so they didn't have space for anything better. Uh, 20 minutes is, of course, just 50% of the way uh, towards their uh, task. Okay, go, go. And uh, so they coded and implemented that, and uh, Microsoft Usability Labs kindly decided they would, uh, for free, measure all the usability uh, measures, and Microsoft Usability Labs overnight, Thursday to Friday, said you saved 38 minutes, which is 95% of your target. Congratulations, the design was twice as good as you estimated. Uh, they then spent a weekend trying to get to at least 100, and over the weekend, one, one guy, uh, not the whole team, got to 20 minutes, which is 12.5% more than necessary. So this is sorted, no longer has priority, and week 10, they can do that or that or third one. They've got three more weeks to play with. What they always, by the way, after uh, nine out of 12 weeks or 75% of the time, they have achieved on the average 91.8% of all their value. In other words, they're ahead of the curve. This is the new burn down cycle. It's a value cycle, value to cost cycle. It's not a we have coded cycle, which may or may not uh, give you the value one. We're, we're changing our focus to numeric values as understood by our users and customers primarily. So, it's so that. Uh, they also, for fun, compute priorities where red means you better worry about it, uh, green means you're cool, don't even think about using any effort on it, and yellow means your tolerable level uh, you've got the minimum or worst acceptable case, but you're still not green, meaning you've not reached your goal level. So this, uh, in other words, this is such a logical system that priority can be computed directly by the spreadsheet. This, these are the um, 25 goals they set for the 16 people, and each one of these is a four-person team approximately working in parallel for a 12-week cycle. And you can see from the cumulative numbers here that all the teams are largely up there at about uh, 90% of achievement within 75% of the time. In other words, well ahead of the curve, delivering good value for money and time. This is the uh, weekly cycle. We're not going to go through it in detail. We developed this part in rather large use of the EVO method at Hewlett Packard. We have uh, case studies published by Hewlett Packard on that. Uh, they innovated a little bit what the chief technical officer Petter was going to do, and what Trond was going to do as QA manager, and uh, one would have to study that in, in time. Uh, of the 25 things they did, set out to do in the first quarter, after, by the way, one day of training, I should add, okay? Not two days, okay? You master this in one day, apparently. Uh, these, are some of, these are the five of the 25 that had the most sensational change. For example, the first one, uh, they, uh, the time for us to generate a survey, these are Gallup poll kind of things, was two hours, it got them down to 15 seconds. This is like a free release to the user. Imagine if you're driving to work and it takes an hour, and you drive back, it takes an hour every day, and a new iPhone app, which is free down, freely downloaded, says uh, you will totally use 15 seconds in transport every day, uh, be my guest. But that's what the users were given of sensational results, and they got about 25 really good results, okay? Uh, a, a good sign of a, a method is when the people doing it love it and feel empowered and understand it. So here's Tron's comments on uh, the, the fact that they, they really liked it. They, li they love to strut around the corridor saying, we made this product great, and therefore we are the essential element of this company. Okay, not the directors, not the managers, who are wise enough to make quite sure that the developers got all the credit. Uh, this is the, using their own survey tool, this is how dead pleased their customers were, uh, just about, when they're just about to get the second release. And this on the second quarter are some of the big numbers they achieved by turning to other things 
uh, and uh, you, you keep on churning out quite sensational improvements by just shifting to things not yet done. So, th- so th- that makes the case for delegating the power to the programmers for finding the design. You will not see uh, such numbers in any other context, I believe. Please enlighten me if I'm wrong. And you've got the numbers to prove it, okay? Now, um, the, the same team two years later did something I think pretty interesting. Uh, they, they said, this is really successful, this idea of engineering towards multidimensional goals and empowering us to find things. Works great. We have a problem, they had the problem before we met them, uh, not surprising, the eight-year-old uh, startup hacking together code to get on the air and serve the market. There was no grand plan of elegant architecture so it would be easy to maintain. Okay, so the first thing we suggested is they invested a little one day a week in um, um, cleaning up the code, uh, but that didn't work very well. So uh, we, they themselves figured out something much smarter to reduce their technical debt. Um, and uh, what they did was, they, they made a list of the technical debt aspects, in other words, the attributes to the system that was, made it more or less easy to change and test and debug the system, which are here. They set numerical goals, and then they gave themselves one week every month called the Green Week, where they worked on their own programming environment. Again, they're changing their own environment, okay? And they do, they, it's exactly like uh, Raytheon in principle, uh, but they're specifically given a week, a month, guaranteed every month, where they will be nice to themselves, the programmers and developers. They decide what their agenda is, they decide the design, they make it happen one way or the other, and they uh, measure whether they're in fact reducing their technical debt as described by a set of things like that and a set of goals like that. I thought that was bloody brilliant. I wish I'd thought of it myself. I didn't, but I can at least tell you that my client uh, figured that out. Devote, uh, devote time to, um, instead of um, uh, refactoring, which only at best messes with the code, they're messing with the whole system, including testing of everything they do to maintain the system. So they're engineering reduction of technical debt. And I don't think you do that by just letting a programmer loose on the source code. Okay, so maybe I've said that well enough. Let's go and take a look at uh, another uh, great, historical great, something called the clean room method, which was developed by Harlan Mills at IBM in the 70s. Now, how many people here say, I know what the clean room method is? One, two, three, over there with the speakers group. (laughs) Okay, rest of you, innocence, okay, Thomas. Um, Let me introduce you to uh, Clean Room. First, we we start with Harlan Mills. He got an interesting challenge. He's, he's, for me, he's like Leonardo da Vinci of software engineering, the genius. And he was at IBM Federal Systems Division with all the rocket scientists, quite literally, space and military rockets. And IBM's problem was that every time they won a bid, Uh, they were the lowest bidder. And every time they took that, they lost money. That is, they spent more money than the lowest bid. So they were just continually losing money on all their contracts, and they finally said, this has to stop. Either we find a way of earning money when we win the lowest bidder contract, or we get out of the business. Uh, Harlan, you have some time to figure out if there's a smarter way of treating the situation of we just have a fixed income from the government and we don't want to cheat to get the rest of the money we'd like to have. So he actually worked for 10 years and reported in IBM System Journal number 4, 1980, quite extensively. That's web available. Um, now, uh, there are two case studies here. One's the LAMPS project, a Navy helicopter system, and the other is the NASA uh, shuttle ground software. But uh, now you'll see uh, what is clearly um, a, an, an uh, uh, incremental system, they are shipping the system in 45 incremental deliveries. That means 2%. That means once a month, every month for four years. 
This is clearly what we would today call agile. And they're very certainly using numbers and engineering for qualities like availability. Very, very clearly, as I shall show you in a moment with Quinn and uh, and designing and engineering on every cycle. But let's uh, focus on the bottom line here. Um, there were very few late or, or late, uh, understand, overrun means budget overrun, financially overrun. In other words, uh, if you overrun, you lose money. If you don't overrun, you break even or earn money. In the very few such deliveries in that decade, and none at all in the past four years, uh, they're building some of the most complex, high-quality systems on Earth, space and military, to the very highest quality levels, and yet they are uh, achieving that uh, on time, under budget, and they're making money. This is perfect project management for software. This is something everybody should learn the recipe and repeat it. This is agile at its best. It's agile, but it's engineering, too. These are engineers that understand the quantification of qualities and the management of them very well. They're not just hacking code, okay? Um, Quinnen, colleague of Mills, uh, uh, is the sort of architect or designer. The point he's making is every cycle they analyze, how did this design work? Did it really give us the availability we thought? Did it cost too much? If negative feedback, find a smarter design. Uh, engineers have a paradigm called design to cost, okay? So, and I call this dynamic design to cost because they're doing it every cycle. And they're trying to figure out what is, what is it that can reduce the cost and the timing and still give the high quality. And if necessary, they experiment, measure, and get it right early. That's how they deliver on time, under budget, at the highest cost, le cost levels. They learn to live within their budget, okay? There's no planning poker or any childish games like that here. They're told what their budget is. They're told what their deadline is. They walk in. They have to figure out technically how to get there, and they have to do it evolutionarily in, in small steps. So this is agile as it should be, is what I'd, I'd call it. But anyway, you can study Quinn in, in detail on web available things, okay? Design is an iterative process, not an upfront Again, these are the programmers involved in the loop, uh, you know, not the managers at IBM or the directors or anything like it. They're estimating in the loop, not with planning poker to begin with. They're estimating based on knowledge, facts, and measurements. And then new hypothesis, new trial, see if we know what we're doing this time around. Here's another uh, client of ours. He uh, uh, emailed me 2011, and he mentioned that he'd attended a three-day course at Citigroup in 2006. I didn't remember, but I thought it was nice to get a new book review. He said there's a new book review on my blog or website. But at the end of the book review, he said, by the way, I didn't just read Tom's book. I've been living it for several years. Okay. And then he told the story of what he'd done after he'd been in the, the course there. Um, uh, basically, he said, our, our uh, bank, uh, you recognize Citi as being partly Polish related, and I, was, I actually spent a week here in Poland teaching this gang the methods. I don't know how well that stuck, but we did try. And uh, basically, the, the problem was they were tracking an amazing amount of stuff, and we're very proud of how good they were at tracking everything happening with software, but they were not tracking value delivered to stakeholders. They were tracking functionality programmed and bugs and time, okay? So they were, in a sense, they were, saying they were tracking the wrong things, but they weren't even aware of it. They had the illusion that they were controlling risk, but they were just controlling programming, not the risk of failure to delivery to deliver what the bank actually required. So he started off using our EVO method, which is a, and the agile method that does it with engineering, the agile method that quantifies values, an agile method quite identical to clean room and quite identical to lean startup in principle, okay? Measurement, multidimensional stuff in cycles. And he uh, mentions he, uh, he, of course, he had low profile. I mean, don't run in and say, I'm going to use this radical new method you never heard of. Just do it. And if it works, you will be forgiven is another change tactic here. Um, and now what he mentions here is that we, we taught very carefully. 
Uh, many of those things called requirements that you're required to program are not really requirements. They are largely design. And the programmers should be figuring out the design, not the users. Users should say at a higher level, I want to save time doing that task. But they shouldn't be designing the screen and the gr graphical user interface and all that stuff. So basically, he took that lesson of separating what users wanted, the achievements they wanted, and letting the design itself be part of his team. So, and interesting enough, the requirements remained unchanged for the 14 months of the project. Everybody knows that requirements churn is about 30% a year, okay? But that's really a design churn. And indeed, the, uh, they had plenty of design churn because they plugged in designs that they thought would work, but the designs didn't work, so they had to find some new ones. They're in this, exactly the same mode as a clean room, okay? And uh, bottom line is successfully live, 800 users worldwide, undoubtedly some in Poland here, and big success by sponsoring stakeholders, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, the same Richard Smith is gonna present at a small conference, private conference I hold in London next week, his experiences with Japanese banks. See, I just got to his slides last night. He's still doing it. It's, is it hard to change? Sure, it's incredibly hard to change, especially if managers try by top-down command and control. It is, uh, according to my evidence, it's much easier to change if you delegate the change process to the people who know what's going on and have the power to make a difference, and those are called developers. Uh, Wow, I've actually got time left. <laughs> Just for fun, last night I, I have a hobby. As whenever I do anything, I like to find the 10 principles that summarize it. So just for fun, in the work environment, uh, we need to delegate to the doers, that's you. We need to measure the improvements. We need to let the troops, that's you, identify the common cause defects, the, the, the things that are wrong that are causing many bugs and problems. We need to let you suggest what is the root cause, like I didn't get enough sleep, and we need to uh, uh, let you try out, okay, come to work when you slept enough, okay, or whatever it is, okay? In the product development area, uh, the, the troops need to, as in confirm it, need to choose the value goal to work on. In other words, which one of these goals are gonna work on, they, that's choice. They need to estimate the power of their ideas, not just throw an idea, say, let's program it and see what happens, but estimate in advance, it'll save 20 minutes. We need to let them decide which of many designs they choose to implement as a team internally and not let any manager or customer interfere with that decision-making process. We need to let them measure the results this week now and total to date uh, so they know where they are and they know how uh, they're getting towards the uh, goal levels. And we need to credit them for the results and reward them for their success. My suggestion was always if they were done in nine weeks, all the goal levels, shouldn't they have three weeks extra holiday? Uh, that's been turned down time and time again. The nearest we ever got to a reward like that is they had three weeks uh, to do training of their choice at any conference in the world. That they thought they could get away with. They said, we can't give them a uh, vacation. Everybody else in the company would be so jealous it wouldn't work, okay? But nice idea, okay? So, the revolution has been here for decades, but maybe you didn't learn about it. Uh, but I've tried to inform you as best I could, give you a lot of stuff to follow up. Uh, so, you know, as, as uh, was it Karl Marx, Workers of the World Unite, something like that? You guys remember that stuff. <laughs> anyway, Programmers of the World Unite. Um, finally, um, if, if you really want to read a tough book with it, the deepest wisdom I've managed to collect for about 40 years. I'll give you a free digital copy if you send me an email. If you don't want to read anything heavy, uh, I've tried to put some lighter reading, uh, 14 papers on Agile, including many things I've been talking about now, at this address, although we're still struggling with the internet trying to get it in there. So it may be a while, but sometime today that address will be valid. Uh, the first person who finds stuff there, check it out and let me know. Uh, but uh, so a copy of the slides are there and copy of my uh, papers. And um, a small miracle has happened. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.